Thank you, Skipper. I appreciate it. Like Skipper said, uh, I am retired uh, in the Navy. And on uh, September 11th, I had retired and been retired from my civilian job as an investigator for the state of California. And uh, I was on doing some reserve uh, duty. And uh, I was working out at building 1443, which is where I still am working right now uh, with the security folks out there. That morning I came in at the east door and uh, Lieutenant Paul Wunsch, who was a DOD lieutenant, was sitting out in the smoke pit. He told me, he says, hey, Bill, he said, did you hear that some airplane just hit the Pentagon? In my mind, I'm thinking uh, some little private plane got off course and crashed in there. Well, it was something a little bigger than that, as we all know. So I went in the office and it was a lot of confusion. At that time, our uh, commander's guide on how to set up the base to protect it was a little thin blue booklet about like this. Right now it's a binder about this thick and it's a constant living document called the AT plan. Well, I talked to the director and I said, sir, you're gonna need some more bodies. He says, I sure will. I said, okay, so I called my LPO in our reserve unit. I said, look, how many folks can you get out here? He says, I'm already on it, sir. I said, okay. So on December 12th, 2001, there is probably 15 or so of our folks checking in to building three, drawing weapons, and they're out on on guard duty and uh, assisting the base. I asked him, I said, how long do you need him? He says, oh, five days ought to take care of that. Well, we all know it went on a little longer than five days. After five days, I said, do you need some more? He said, I sure do. So again, we were able to draw from our reserve unit. Some could come in, some had to go back. So we had another group in there. Well, a few days later, everybody gets mobilized. So they're sent anywhere overseas, up and down the states. Um, I'm still on orders, but I didn't get mobilized. I'm thinking, what's wrong with this picture? It's kind of like when you're in high school and you go out for the football team and you practice all week and come time for the game on Friday night, coach lets you sit on the bench. I said, that's not right. Well, October, about the 1st of October, I get a call from YN1 Johnson. He's our admin person at the Naval Air Reserve. He said, sir, you won the lottery. I'm thinking, oh boy, it's the whiz quiz or your analysis. He says, no, 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 you got mobilized. I said, oh, really? He goes, yeah. You go into the USS Blue Ridge, LCC 19, out of Yokosuka, Japan, and you're gonna be on the Seventh Fleet staff in their force protection department. I said, ooh, cool. So I said, that's nice. And he says, oh yeah, but you have three days to get to San Diego, get mobilized and go. I'm thinking, well, that's a little short, but okay, that's what reservists do. We have a bunch of reservists out there, I'm sure, and as you all know, that's kind of how we work. So I said, well, I guess I better call ComNav wife back. So I did and told her what was going on. So she came home. And uh, we had to tell the kids. Well, my kids were 25 and 30, but they're still asking, hey, Dad, where are you going? I said, well, I'm going to Japan. What are you going to do? I don't know. How long are you going to be gone? I don't know. So that unknown, you know, kind of threw them a little bit. Then you do the husband turnover. All right, honey, the trash goes out on Tuesday because they pick it up on Wednesday. Give her the passwords to all the bank accounts so she knows how to pay the bills. Okay, do all that. Oh, and then you have to pack. Well, there is no welcome aboard letter or sponsor or anybody like that. So I had two to three sea bags. I packed every uniform and piece that I had. And three days later, we're over at Hangar 323, which is the Naval Air Reserve headquarters over there. And uh, the duty driver said, all right, throw your junk in the back. And he drove me down to San Diego. Well, that was good, except it was a three-day weekend, so I had to spend an extra three days down there. But about October 7th, 
uh, here I am, me and my three sea bags, arriving in Yokosuka, Japan, and it's always in the middle of the night, lugging them down to the pier, reporting on board. Uh, so I did, and I was assigned to the Force Protection Department, and my job was going out doing Pivas, for integrated vulnerability assessments and advanced parties. So as a sh before a ship goes into a port, we go out and do a survey, give them a report so they know what to expect. And then when the ship pulls in, myself and a couple other of us are there a few days before to set up the security. So I did this, duty was great, uh, everywhere between India and Australia. So I was there for about a year and then, you know, got demoed, came back, luckily got a job here and then got tagged again, went to Iraq. I turned 60 while I was over there and they said, you're too old, you got to retire. So as a reservist, I came home and retired. And again, this is just my story and I know everybody out there also knows where you were, what you were doing and has a story like that. So. I would also like to say thank you, all of you, for your service, not only you, but your family members that put up with us doing what we do. So again, thank you all for your service. Thank you, Mr. Forster. On September 11th, 2001, terror rocked our nation. For most Americans, 9-11 remains a defining moment in our lives and for our nation. Even today, honoring the 22-year anniversary of September 11th, it is difficult to fully comprehend the immeasurable tragedy and devastation of the event that day. But amid the horror of that day, we also witnessed tremendous courage, valor, sacrifice embodied in first responders and who gave their own lives to save those in need and an extraordinary citizens who fought back over the skies of Pennsylvania, and in doing so, they became heroes. On this day, 22 years ago, attackers boarded four domestic flights at three East Coast airports and carried out terrorist attacks against the World Trade Center. In New York and Pentagon, in Washington, D.C. At approximately 8.46 a.m., American Airlines Flight 11, carrying 92 passengers from Boston to Los Angeles, crashed into the 93rd and 99th floors of the World Trade Center's North Tower. As the evacuation of the tower and its twin got underway, Television cameras broadcasted live images of what initially appeared to be freak accident. The North Tower was the first of the Twin Towers to be completed, the first hit, and the last to fall. At approximately 9.03 a.m., 18 minutes after the first plane hit, United Airlines Flight 175, carrying 65 passengers from Boston to Los Angeles, collided the 75th to 85th floor of the World Trade Center's South Tower. At this point, there was no doubt that the United States was under attack. The South Tower was the second of the Twin Towers to be completed the second to be hit, and the first to fall. At approximately 9.38 a.m., American Airlines Flight 77, carrying 64 passengers from Dulles to Los Angeles, crashed into the western side of the Pentagon, killing all on board and 125 military and civilian personnel in the building. At approximately 10.06 a.m., after passengers and crew members aboard United Airlines Flight 93 attempted to retake the plane from hijackers, the aircraft crashed 
in Somerset, Pennsylvania, killing all 44 passengers. The plane's intended target was not known, but theories include the White House, the U.S. Capitol, the Camp David retreat, or one of the several nuclear power plants along the eastern seaboard. The story of courage on board. The story of courage from those on board Flight 93 is left to inspire all Americans. Because the plane had been delayed in taking off, passengers on board Flight 93 learned of events in New York and watched them via cell phone and air phone calls on the ground. Knowing that the aircraft was not returning to an airport that hijackers claimed, a group of passengers and flight attendants planned their insertion. One of the passengers, Thomas Burnett Jr., told his wife on the phone that, I know we're all going to die. There are three of us who are going to do something about it. I love you, honey. Another passenger, Todd Beamer, was heard saying, are you guys ready? Let's roll. Over an open line, Sandy Bradshaw, a flight attendant, called her husband and explained that she had slipped into the galley and was filling pictures with boiling water. Her last words to him were, I was one of the first class. I have to go. Bye. Time and memories led to the creation of three vessels commemorating 9-11 heroes. The vessels include the USS New York, commissioned in November 2009, USS Somerset, commissioned in April 2012, and the USS Arlington, commissioned in April 2013. Seven and a half tons of steel savage from the World Trade Center were cast as the bow stern of the USS New York. Still taken from the Pentagon after September 11 attacks are displayed on board USS Arlington. About 22 tons of steel from a crane that stood near United Airlines Flight 90 crash site have been used as to have been used to construct USS Somerset steam hold. The quote: "No memory shall erase you from the memory of time." Is part of a giant mosaic despite in the sky's colors. The morning attacks the National September 11 Memorial Museum. Today, as we remember. Our hearts go out to the many families that have suffered the loss of a father, a mother, a son, a daughter, or a close friend. Words cannot fully nor adequately express our sorrow and grief. Thank you. Will the guests please rise as MA2 Anna Tompkins and CS1 Anna Brotherton now lay remembrance wreaths in honor of our all first responders, those who served our country, and all of those who lost their lives on September 11th, 2001. We will never forget the 2,753 people who died in the World Trade Center in its vicinity. We will never forget the 125 people that died in the Pentagon. We will never forget the 343 fighter fighters, police officers, and paramedics who sacrificed their lives that day. We will never forget the 1,006 people who lost a spouse. We will never forget the 3,051 children who lost their mother or father that day. We will never forget the 266 lives that were lost on board flights 11, 77, 93, and 175. And we will never forget the 243 troops that lost their lives while supporting Operation Enduring Freedom. Rifle team, take charge. Rifle team, light change, what? Present arms. Left face. Ready. Load. Aim. Fire.
Ready? Load. Aim. Fire. Ready? Load. Aim. Fire. Freeze it. Arms. Thank you all. Please be seated. To quote former President George W. Bush, we are a country awakened to danger and called to defend freedom. Our grief has turned into anger and our anger to resolution. Whether we bring enemies to justice or bring justice to our enemies, justice will be done. America was targeted for attack because we're the brightest beacon for freedom and opportunity in the world. And no one will keep that light from shining. I look around as we gather this morning and that light is still shining. Chaplain Rivera will now offer the benediction. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, gracious Lord, on this solemn day of remembrance, may we honor the lives that were lost in this tragic act. May we give thanks for those who have served, saved, and rendered aid and assistance. May we give comfort to those who still live with loss. May we seek justice and peace where it is within our ability and rely on you when that ability escapes us. On this day of solemn remembrance, May we build what has been torn down. May we mend what has been broken. May we live your love when hate seems to reign. May we bear witness to the cause of peace. May we remember your great love for us and that there is no greater demonstration of love than to lay down one's life for another. Grant that the reflections today honor those who have served and who have died, that we honor their legacy, that we may commit ourselves to be more vigilant in our love for others, for our nation, and for the cause of freedom, justice, and peace throughout the world. May the remembrance of the price they pay for our life as a nation impel us to seek justice, foster freedom, and pursue peace. May our nation be a source of blessing to all its people and to the rest of mankind. And Almighty God, we ask that you bless and honor our fallen. Eternal rest grant upon them, O Lord. May the souls of all these faithful departed rest in peace and rise in your glory. Amen. Amen. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. And thank you for joining us this morning. And remember, and one quick part, when I, I, I want everybody to repeat. When I say we must, I want everybody to repeat, never forget. Can we do that? Okay. We must. Never forget. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> hey, uh, Real quick before everybody runs off, uh, in the Marine Corps we have a saying that says every good battle plan works real good until the first boots hit the ground. Well, in this case, uh, it's before the first wheels hit the road. 
uh, our Malibu parking plan has kind of gone a little south on us. So we will be going, uh, splitting you guys around down there. Just pay attention to the, the sheriff. Do what they tell you to do. Be patient with this thing. It kind of went sideways while this thing was going on. But so. we didn't have to pay any permits for it, so. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we'll take that. And uh, and they wanted me to really reiterate, please stay in the right lane. Uh, they're going to be busting uh, down the road pretty fast. They don't need any of us shooting out into the area. So just stay in the right lane, please. And have a fantastic ride. We'll see you at the other end. Hurry!